and welcome to the very first episode of Lessons from Success, guys. I'm your host, Bryn Turner, and today we've got an amazing guest joining us, which is Scott Miller. Now, Scott is the founder of BOP Industries, and at only 18 years old, he's on absolute fire. He currently manages a dozen staff between the ages of 22 and 56, and he's a huge player in the hologram space here in Australia as well. Now, he creates holograms from the size of your phone to life-size structures that can broadcast keynote speeches from, from basically across the world. He's also a huge player in the education space for rural and regional Australia, and he's been teaching kids a lot about tech, about how they can also be a successful entrepreneur, and all those cool little, little lessons he's learned along the way as well. Now, he's also looking to expand globally in 2019, and he's got his sights set on China. He's got a lot of great advice for people who can start and along and everything he's learned along the way and he's honestly such an amazing first guest to have on the show. So without further ado, let's get him on. Alrighty, well welcome my very first guest Scott to the show. Scott's from uh, Bop Industries and he's going to tell us a little bit more about what he does in his business. So welcome Scott. Thank you for having me, really excited to be sharing. Um, So for me, I'm Scott Miller, I'm 18 years old and I'm also the CEO and founder of a company called Bop Industries. At BOP, we're on a mission to inspire the next generation of digital creators, and we do that through two ways. Um, the first is through our education side of our business. So we run workshops teaching students of all ages about technology, entrepreneurship, and storytelling, all with a focus on creativity. Um, and as well as that too, we also work in the event space. So helping companies create um, immersive experiences for their guests and doing events and conferences a little bit differently. So we get to work with technologies like holograms, augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D printing, um, projectors, and a whole range of really cool stuff like that. That's awesome. So uh, uh, something I definitely have to mention is Scott's only 18 years old and he's basically killing it in this space. Um, I've never met anyone that's 18 and has his head screwed on <laughs> as much as he has. And I've, I've only really met him for about 10, 15 minutes here. So it's been absolutely <laughs> awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the moment, um, where your plans are, uh, what your goals are for 2019 and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. So we've just wrapped up 2018 um, and I've actually only just landed from a trip to China, which has been really exciting, looking at expanding overseas in 2019. Um, so for us, in 2018, we educated over 12,000 students all across Australia with our workshops um, and had an absolute blast doing that. So for us in 2019, we're going to be continuing to grow our um, impact. We're going to be taking our programs overseas, so looking at the Asian, the North American, the Middle Eastern and the European markets, which has been fantastic. Um, And we're also really excited to announce um, that we're going to be revamping our hologram side of our business. So really shifting from manufacturing holograms to creating immersive marketing experiences and immersive event experiences for our customers. Um, But for us in 2018, so I graduated year 12 about 12 months ago. um, And I remember 12 months ago, I was sitting here and I was seriously debating whether or not to go to university. I'd just graduated. I'd gotten two scholarship offers, um, which was a bit of a big deal um, at the time. And I was really debating, do I want to run my business in 2018 or do I want to go to university and do that safe pathway? And... Um, I decided to defer university. I turned down the scholarships, which was a fun conversation with my parents. <laughs> um, but I've absolutely loved it. So over the past 12 months, um, our team has quadrupled in size and it's set to um, grow again in 2019, which is super exciting. Um, and I've just been able to do some really awesome stuff that I think business has really unleashed for an 18-year-old. Um, so for me, like the other week, I was doing a presentation to the team at Kellogg's Australia. The week before that, I was partying with the Prime Minister of Estonia. Um, and the week before that, I was partying in Bangkok. Like, it was totally crazy. Um, but I think a lot of that does come from a lot of hard work. Um, one thing that I always get asked, one, one thing that I always get told is people say, oh, your life must be so awesome. All you do is fly around the world and party with people um, and speak at different events and... I think a lot of what goes into it is that hard work. So I do 11, 12 hour days pretty much every day. Um, But it's because I love what I do um, and I couldn't see myself doing anything different. So for 2019, I've officially dropped out of university. Nice. (laughs) Um, And yeah, really looking forward to continuing to grow our business even further. That's so cool, man. That's absolutely awesome. Uh, What were your scholarship offers, dare I ask? Yeah, um, scholarship (laughs) offers were for studying bachelors of business and bachelors of entrepreneurship. Um, How you teach a bachelor of entrepreneurship, I'm still not too sure. I didn't even know they offered bachelor of entrepreneurship. Yeah, a couple of universities across Australia are starting to get them popping up. Um, And yeah, they were looking to get me on board to say like, hey, young entrepreneur taking the course. Um, But I'm so excited. Like, I think one thing for me when I decided to defer university was I said, look, I, no matter what I do, I've got to keep learning. Um, yeah. At the time I was 
18 years, uh, 17 years old at the time. I'd just graduated year 12. I had no business degree, no formal business experience or training. Um, and for me, I thought, right, if I want to build a big scalable business, I've got to learn as much as I can. So I actually found myself doing an accelerator program. So an accelerator is pretty much a three month intensive course um, that's designed to accelerate your business. Um, so really it's pretty much a three year business degree packed down into three months, um, crazy. which is absolutely crazy. So we did that um, in the start of 2018, which was fantastic here in Brisbane. And for us, it really helped us build a really solid foundation um, for our business. We learned about how to build a scalable business from day one, and it helped us do a lot of strategy and planning so that when we finished the course um, in around July this year, then we we're like, right, we're ready to go. And since July, we've just been kicking it off, getting out to as many schools and as many events as possible. Um, and it's just been absolutely crazy. We've loved it. That's so cool. Who did you do the accelerator program through? Uh, so the accelerator program was through a... Um, child company of QUT, um, the Queensland University of Technology, called Creative Enterprise Australia. So the accelerator was all around creative technology. Um, and yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. It gave us exactly what we needed at the time. That's so cool. And you said, so you're in the hologram business from what I saw online and you're looking at going into the event space a lot more as well. How did you get into holograms and, and tell us what it's all about? That's that's unreal. Um, to me, a hologram is still so far in the future. So <laughs> yeah. let us know how you got into it. That's Absolutely. Awesome. So for me, my business journey started back at 14 years old. Um, I was in grade nine at school and part of my school's business program was in term four of every year, we get into groups, we develop a product, write a business plan for it, and we pitch to our business teachers for $100 investment, which for a 14-year-old is a fair bit of pocket money. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my team and I, we initially started just selling key rings. Um, so we called them hashtag key rings. They had a hashtag and then a word after them. You could get them in any color, any design you wanted. Um, and we just started selling them around our school community um, for a term. And within a term, we made a few hundred dollars, which was absolutely awesome. Um, we were like excited just to break even, let alone make a profit. Um, and we learned a lot about business along the way. And I absolutely loved it. Even from when I was really little, I was always one of those kids that even at five, six years old, I always wanted to sit at the adult's table and just listen and partake in adult conversation. So yeah. for me... At 14 years old, when I, I have vividly remember sitting on the couch one night um, with mum, and mum was sitting there on her laptop doing a report up for her work. Um, and I was super excited because I got to sit there writing my business plan, and I felt like an adult as well. That's um, so cool. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was that summer holidays that I was applying for jobs, but found as a 14 year old, it was so hard to find one. Um, employees wanted someone with more free time and more experience. And I was always one of those kids that was super involved with extracurriculars at school, like at school at seven in the morning until seven each night, um, doing different sporting things, performing arts things, and still trying to get um, relatively good grades on top of that. So I couldn't really find time to get a job, um, really couldn't find time to work. So I thought, you know what, let's go back to the markets, let's keep selling those key rings and see where we go. Um, I knew I wasn't gonna be doing key rings for the rest of my life, but I'd identified that the skills that I was learning in business, no matter what I did, was gonna help me, um, no matter what pathway I wanted to do when I graduated. Um, so at that point, I went back to the markets. Every, I spent, I think I spent thirty-five dollars on my first market stall, just at a local Brisbane markets, um, and I just started selling these key rings for about four hours every Saturday morning, and made a few hundred dollars every weekend, which was pretty cool as a fourteen-year-old. Awesome. Yeah, um, absolutely. And yeah, because I just heard all my friends complaining about annoying bosses, inflexible times, and just hating their jobs. So I was like, right, <laughs> let's do a job that I genuinely want to do. Um, and from there, it started to grow really quickly. We jumped onto e-commerce and started setting up our own online stores. Awesome. Um, and by the time I was 15, we were selling thousands of key rings every month to um, customers all around the world and also to dealing with some big corporates like the um, Queensland University of Technology and some also some big companies over in Europe as well. Um, so bought my own laser cutter, a whole nother story about learning how to rebuild a laser cutter just off YouTube tutorials. <laughs> um, and... From the keyrings, I kind of thought, look, if I the keyrings have been nice, but I've been doing it for twelve months at that point. I thought I want to get involved in something exciting, something new, and something fresh. Um, and for me, I'd always idolize like Richard Branson and Elon Musk, and I saw that if I wanted to be on the cutting edge of what's happening next, I've got to be in the tech space. But as a kid, I had a pretty bad experience with technology in school. I had teachers that just weren't passionate about it and really outdated tech and. My previous thoughts were that if I wanted to work in technology, I had to be a developer. I had to code, and that just wasn't really for me. Um, yeah. So I jumped on YouTube, and I typed in cool tech tutorials, um, literally just those three words, and I found a tutorial teaching me how to make holograms, like you see in Star Wars and Iron Man, out of nothing but some cut-out CD cases. 
And as a kid that always loved Star Wars Nine Man, I thought, right, let's give it a go. Um, so I burnt through about 20 of mum's best CD cases one Thursday night. Um, but I created this first hologram that was nothing but some CD cases and a video on my phone. And it was phenomenal. I think I sat there for about three hours, just totally mesmerized by it. And then the next morning I took it into my school's design teachers and I said, look guys, I've made this thing. Um, I don't know what we're going to use it for, but can you help me create a real product out of it? Because at the time it was just being used as a bit of a party trick and no one's really going to want to spend money on some cutout CD cases. <laughs> um, so over the next seven days, we just started prototyping, learning as much as we could about the technology and developing our first products. And within seven days, we launched our first product. That's crazy. Um, yes, yeah, so like really worked hard on getting that minimum viable product up and running. And we jumped on Etsy, we jumped on eBay on the, and on those online platforms. And we just said hey guys, don't know what we're going to use these holograms for, but can you send us some photos and videos of what you're doing with them? And within a couple of days, we had kids over in the UK sending us photos and videos of them using our holograms as holographic pets where they could have a kitten or a puppy dog running around as a nightlight as they fell asleep. Um, We had teachers in Singapore using it to deliver content to their students where they could have Cleopatra or Winston Churchill standing in the classroom. That's insane. Um, And yeah, here in Australia, we just had a bunch of events and marketing companies reach out. Um, We had one company reached out that was Brisbane based. We'd been selling these holograms online for about two weeks and they said, hey, Scott, we've got a big event coming up in two weeks time. We need 200,000 holograms from you. um, And we've got a budget about half a million dollars. What can you do for us? And at that point, I think I'd just turned 16. Oh Um, my God. (laughs) And I took the morning off school and I went into Eagle street, um, went up to like the 30th floor for their, for this meeting. And I was greeted by their entire team and all their clients. And they started quizzing me about whether my factories were set up in Shenzhen or Bangladesh and what my risk mitigation strategy was and how big my team was and what other orders I'd delivered and I was like guys I've got a rundown laser cutter in dad's backyard I'm just a 16 year old and I've got a math exam in 20 minutes Um, (laughs) and it was crazy though I fully expected them to laugh me out of the room they said no that's awesome like we want to work with you to develop a whole range of units for the events and marketing space we think this tech's got some real promise and we want to like we want to help you make that happen so Um, it was awesome. We pretty much sat down, we did a planning session and they told me exactly what an event company is looking for and a marketing company is looking for exactly what they wanted it to do, how much they wanted to spend, everything like that. So from there we started building our first products and just prototyping as much as we could. Yeah. Um, and getting out to as many events as we could. So we were learning about the technology, trying different designs and really just talking to our customers as much as possible. Mm. Um, and from there we... Yeah, just kept becoming known as the go-to place for holograms in Brisbane and Queensland and Australia. Um, and hopefully soon internationally as well. Hopefully soon internationally, <laughs> yeah. And now where we are, we have units ranging from the size of a phone and tablet um, up to our life-size two-meter tall units. So you can walk into a room and see a, hologra- a two-meter tall hologram hanging from the roof like a chandelier, um, spinning wow. around and lit up like a disco ball with someone from anywhere in the world doing a presentation, a keynote, um, wow. where they can be talking and they can wave their arm and have a product shoot out of their arm. They can snap their fingers and do a full costume change. Um, is that like a bit of a, is it a live stream sort of thing or is it a pre-recorded thing? That yeah, they, they do? at the moment it's very much pre-recorded. Um, live stream something we've got in the mix for 2019 though. Nice, exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we get to work with some awesome brands. So we've worked with the likes of QT, um, NEC, GHD, um, a lot of acronyms, but um, yeah, some really awesome multinational brands all across Australia. Um, and yeah, now setting our sights on getting some awesome technology from over in China, um, bringing it back here to Australia. That's cool. And also too, seeing how we can take our services over to the, South East, the Southeast Asian market, um, like Thailand, like um, yeah, um, Indonesia and a whole range of countries like that. Do you have many competitors and things like that in the hologram space? I, I honestly haven't heard too much about it, but that being said, yeah. I guess I'm not really looking in the hologram space too much. But Absolutely. So holograms are such a new technology. Um, yeah. They're still very much in their infancy. Because of that, there's only a handful of companies around the world. Um, what we found is a lot of our competitors, they do really big scale holograms. They do massive stage setups, like the Michael Jackson, Tupac and Whitney Houston holograms. Yeah, I have see. seen the Tupac one. That was yeah. amazing. Um, so that's where a lot of our competitors are at. Or out. But for us, what we want to do is we want to make smaller scale holograms that people can really come up to, they can touch, they can feel, they can interact with. Um, yeah. And very much targeted at the event space and marketing space as well. So you can walk into a retail store and see products spinning around, changing colour, changing shape, changing design. You can walk through a Westfield and see um, a brand ambassador saying, hey guys, I love my new 
um, like glasses or I love my new outfit, make sure to head over to this store to buy them. Um, a whole range of stuff like that is what we're really focusing on. Yeah, I did notice at your price point as well because it is set quite a lot lower than the other ones that I did manage to have a look at. And I think that really opens a space there for you know your smaller retailers, your boutiques and things like that able to get in the space absolutely yeah. yeah and that's for us like we really just want as many people using our holograms as possible and showing us what they're doing with them um for us we think holograms have got an infinite um number of possibilities where you can take them whether it's in the medical field whether it's in the transportation field the design field um anything like that and we just want to get our holograms out there as much as possible and again just going back to like our roots where we started send us some photos and videos of what you're doing with them for some inspiration for sure yeah yeah for sure i think everyone would love to know that they're actually out there as well because i know for me and a lot of people i spoke to just before we had this interview we honestly didn't even know it was it was available to the general public so i think a lot of it will just be getting the word out there that that they do have access to these things at a reasonable cost now as well which is really cool absolutely <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the education piece that you're doing so you're going to a lot of schools out in rural and things like that yeah so for us um we started our education piece purely um just because actually no sorry we started our education piece at the world science festival back in 2017 um so it was more or less an accident that it came to life, but um, pretty much we had the organisers of the World Science Festival reached out and they said, hey, can we have some sort of interactive hologram exhibit on at the World Science Festival? And we said, yeah, all right, let's run some film your own hologram workshops. Um, so I got myself and a couple of mates, we took some a uh, bit of time off school um, and we went and set up a shop in the, World Sci in the Queensland Museum for the World Science Festival, Brisbane. And we started running these workshops and it was really funny actually we had the organizers they kept warning us they were like okay guys like be careful it's going to be a busy couple of days so like make sure you're prepared um and we were like oh guys we're running a business we're only year 12 like you don't know busy we are like the epitome of busy um we'll be fine but we got so, like it was crazy we had something like four to eight thousand people coming through our workshop alone um wow. in four days and there was something like one hundred and twenty thousand people coming through the festival so it's incredible yeah it was we were dealing with a few hundred people every single hour coming through learning how they can build their own holograms um and it was a brilliant time we had so much fun and from there, we had a bunch of people reaching out saying, hey, we love what you did. Can you run some workshops with our school, with our university, everything like that? And from there, it really got me thinking. And I thought, hey, if I can start a business, like any other kid can as well. I wasn't born into some sort of big business family. I just kind of learned it through a bit of hard work, determination, and some really awesome mentors. Um, so we started running these programs, initially just around technology with a focus on creativity. So showing kids that there's more to technology than just coding. Um, I think coding is absolutely fantastic. It's a really important skill to have um, and teaches you so much, but we want to show kids that there's more than just that to tech. Yeah. Um, and also too, that tech goes outside of the technology classroom. You can use it in history, geography, science, English, maths, like any subject you can use tech to help aid your learning. Um, and from there, we started growing even further. So we now run programs um, around technology. So showing kids it's awesome tech and then seeing how it can be used to solve some real world problems. We look at small business and entrepreneurship. So looking at how you can um, start your own businesses and also to how you can start your own small businesses. So if we say, all right, here's a hundred dollars. How can you turn that into $500 in eight weeks? Um, building a business, playing with Facebook ads, going to local market stalls and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also look at as well with storytelling. So we see so many kids that idolize um, Instagram influencers, YouTube stars and everything like that. And we look at, okay, cool, how much work actually goes into that? It, it doesn't just happen by accident. You've got to build your brand, build your business. Um, and then you've also got to use all these cross-curricular skills. So you've got your um, business skills with like building your brand, your art and design skills with like making it look pretty um, and doing your branding. Then you've got your English skills with scripting and writing your content, media skills with filming and editing it, um, and then just general skills to how you can repurpose it. So you can make content for YouTube, you can make it for Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, podcasts, blogs, everything like that. Um, so we also run those programs as well, teaching kids how they can build their own personal brands too. Um, and then, yeah, for us, over the past 12 months, we've educated 12,000 kids. We have a really wow. big focus on regional Australia. Um, so we've just gotten back from our regional innovation tour where we went to every region from Gold Coast up to um, northern Queensland, which was fantastic. Um, and we have an absolute ball. Like, we want to show the regional kids that you don't have to be in the big cities anymore to be able to do cool stuff. All you need is a laptop and an internet connection. Um, and along our way, we've met some phenomenal people doing just that. So... 
we've got some of um like some of the friends we've got we've in Bundaberg there's one of Australia's um, top data scientists that lives in Bundaberg because he loves the lifestyle. He's by the beach, he's wow. in the country with his family, um, but he's also, yeah, one of Australia's top five data scientists. That's incredible. Um, it's crazy. We've got people running massive businesses out of Townsville and Rockhampton. Um, and, yeah, we want to share that with as many students as possible um, yeah. and really bring those programs now all across Australia and all across the world. That's we've, so cool. Yeah, done a lot of testing in... Queensland, we've got some awesome programs ready to go, and now it's just about rolling them out um, as far and wide as possible. That's cool. I mean, with tech now, the geographical sort of restrictions that people used to have are essentially gone. Totally, totally. Yeah, we're seeing people all around the world collaborating in real time um, and working on some really exciting projects. That's so cool. Uh, you mentioned about uh, teaching kids how to start with business and everything like that. I know it's a bit of a generalized question, but I always like to ask, what's the what do you think the first step is going into business? I think... One thing that I'm seeing a lot is these young people that go out there that are still in, like, they're still teenage, that are like, right, if we want to start a business, we've got to raise $200,000, $500,000, like a couple of million dollars. And I think my biggest piece of advice for kids would be that, don't, would be to not worry about funding, just worry about starting. Like, do something small scale, really build that minimum viable product, whether it's going to the market, starting an e-commerce store, just do something that's manageable that you can fund yourself um, and that can fund the rest of your expansion. We see, like I think with investors, they're looking, f if they are giving you $200,000, they want to be sure that you're going to turn that into a million dollars in a couple of, like in a year or something like that. So um, as a young person, you've got like no prior experience, no um, real credibility. So it's up to you to build that cred yourself. Um, so for us, we started just selling hearings at markets and then, we kind of grew that gradually and it was really good because we made mistakes like everyone makes mistakes in business and it's far better to make a mistake when you're only dealing with hundreds of dollars rather than hundreds of thousands of dollars um and it was a really awesome way for us to do that and it also built a lot of credibility as well saying hey we've overcome this milestone then we're doing another milestone then another milestone um and it got to the point where we had investors offering us like asking us if they can invest and we're like actually we're self-funded like we don't need the investment um, which has been really cool. So I'd say just start and find your minimum viable product. Find something that you can start selling right now to make some money and to start learning. Um, and yeah, just remember that your businesses don't, like your first business doesn't have to change the world. Um, but you're in such an awesome place to start a business. Like you don't have to worry about paying rent, buying food, anything like that. Like just give it a go, see what you can create. And also to start building your network of mentors and people you know. Um, it's so much these days about who you know as opposed to what you know. Um, and yeah, you're a young person. People love to help young people. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, how do you go about getting like your first mentor out there? I think for me, my first mentors I found um, were through just going to different events. Like I got out there as much as I could. I was really lucky. I got involved in the startup space from a really young age, um, from 14 years old when there wasn't a startup space um, <laughs> in Brizzy. And I literally just started going along to as many events as possible. I'd go to the co-working spaces after school on weekends, like whenever I got some free time. Um, and I just started meeting people and I just kind of took that philosophy, um, took a bit of advice actually that my grandfather always used to tell me, um, which was, you've got to sell yourself before you can sell your product, um, which pretty much says that if you're a nice, pe if you're a nice person, people are genuinely going to want to help you. Um, That's true. So I just went along with a smile, um, like a big smile, a lot of questions, um, and I was helping out wherever I could. So like if someone needed help setting up for an event, I was there like helping them um, put out chairs. If someone needed help, um, like needed a guest speaker, I'd jump up and I'd talk about whatever I could talk about. Um, and yeah, just quickly be like, tried to make as many connections as possible. And I didn't try and force it with the mentors. Like, and I didn't really make it official either. I just found people that I genuinely enjoyed spending time with them that I found really fascinating. Um, and I'd just say like, hey, can we catch up for a coffee? Or we'd sit around having lunch or something like that. And I'd just start asking them a lot of questions um, and learning from that. I think that's one of the most important things as well. And you, you really touched on it there. Having a mentor isn't necessarily uh, a spoken thing like it's not a spoken relationship being like yes you're my mentor and i'm your mentor like yeah. it's definitely more of it's a friendship sort of thing totally um and when you do need to ask the questions they're there to help you answer them i, I think a lot of people kind of get that sort of confused in their brain a little bit and think it's a very strict relationship of they help with business directly and mm -hmm. everything like that but as you said about not trying to force it i mean that's so spot on if you're not a good personality uh, personality match then they won't be a good mentor for you Exactly. I think it's the whole saying that you become 
like you become the five people you spend the most time with. So if it's up to you to find the people that you look up to and you want to be like. Um, mm. Surround yourself with them, spend as much time as possible with them. Um, and I think, yeah, it's really interesting seeing all the young entrepreneurs around Brisbane now. Um, and you can pick just based on their personality who their mentor is because they're like a little mini mentor. Um, like, it's so funny. But... So cool and so bad in some ways yeah. as well. <laughs> some people it's like, oh my God, that's awesome. Some people it's like, oh my God, that's a that's Yeah, oh dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh dear. We didn't need He's another mentoring. one. mentoring? Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But um, yeah, and I don't think I've ever asked anyone outright, will you be my mentor? And no one's ever asked me, will you be my mentee or mentor or anything like that? Um, so just, yeah, be a friend. Be a good friend. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think it's really important as well when you don't have the experience and when you don't have the knowledge to put yourself out there. I mean, help set up chairs. You've always got, there's always something you can do to help out people and you'll be surprised at what comes of it, right? Like, oh, totally. Yeah. As, as soon as you offer your time or services to anyone, they completely respect that because a lot of people expect the world these days for literally nothing. Mm. Um, and the fact that you're going out there, the fact that you can socialize with these people without always trying to get something off them in the exactly. first place is one of the most important things. Yeah. I think one of my favorite things about the startup community at the moment is this give first mentality that they've really embraced um which is the whole idea of like paying it forward so it's like if you help set up chairs for someone's event um then they'll probably return the favor so they might connect you with someone you've always wanted to meet or get you a one-on-one meeting with um someone that's going to be awesome for your business but also too you don't have to worry about like there's no rule that says you can't attend a startup event until you've actually got your own startup or until you're making a million dollars like even if you don't have your own idea or if you're not part of a startup just come along and meet people anyway um because then when you do have that idea you're going to already have that network set up and it'll be so much quicker um but also too i think the mentality that everyone has to be a founder um is so wrong like i think we're seeing now so many people that are like we've got an oversupply of founders that are desperate for team members um and it's totally okay to be a supporter like not everyone's built to be a founder um and there is nothing wrong at all with being a supporter like i have mad respect for people who work for startups um and i think they're the best kind of people because they're willing to roll up their sleeves and help out um and they get some really phenomenal opportunities as well well, I mean, on that topic, how would you go about finding startups that do require team members, especially for the people that just want the experience and everything like that? Yeah, totally. I think startups are time poor and money poor as well. <laughs> so if you're willing to help out um, for little to no money, um, I think that's exactly what they're looking for, really. It doesn't matter what your skill set. Like, startups very rarely will ask for your resume. Like, for us, I've never seen a resume from any of my staff members because I don't ask for it, I don't want it, and I don't need it. Um, I base pu- I hire predominantly just based on whether or not I think they're a good person, like, the vibe I get from them. Um, if they seem like... I always say to my team, I'm like, look, I can teach you the content, but I can't teach you to be passionate, driven, and a good person. Um, so if they're pas- if I see the passion, if I see the drive, and I genuinely think they're just really happy to help um that's the kind of people i want on my team and i think that's similar with a lot of startups so i'd say just to go along to the events go to the co-working spaces and say hey guys like i'm looking to help out any startups that need help um and here's what i'm good at here's what i'm interested in um and let me know and you'll have i can guarantee you'll be flooded with offers from startups being like please come and help us but i wouldn't worry too much about the money like startups genuinely well the majority of startups at least genuinely have your best interests at heart um so even if they can't pay you now they're going to do everything they can just to pay you a little bit to say thank you so much for your help um but the connections they'll be able to get you are phenomenal so for my team i've said to them i was like look if you want to meet anyone or if you want to know anything like let me know and i'll find you that person to meet or i'll set up a meeting for you um and a lot of it is those connections and Like, for me, I've had numerous job offers from other people, like, while I've been running my own startup, just because they've said, hey, we see you're doing this stuff, but can you come and work for us? Um, And I think that's something a lot of startup supporters see as well. Like, you'll meet people at events, you'll um, have people reaching out saying, hey, I love your work, I know you're working for a startup now, but would you consider coming and working for us in, like, KPMG or, like, Accenture or something like that instead? Um, So, like, big corporates that have got their eyes on startups. Alrighty, so you're such a positive person. Um, how do you how do you stay so positive, so energetic? Like, what's your what's your daily routine sort of look like in in the twelve hour work days that you do, and any either side? Absolutely. So for me, I I am a chronic workaholic. Um, I think I very much get that from my mum, but I would not have it any other way. Um, so for me, 
I've actually dealt with a lot of burnout before, um, and it's taken me a while to find my balance. So, like, through during year 11, I got glandular fever. Year 12, I got laryngitis. Um, wow. This year, I'm just, like, kind of got my fingers crossed being, like, just make it till Christmas. Don't fall over. <laughs> um, but it took me a long time to find that routine, but I think it's very much changed. So, through school, it was all about, for me, finding the best way my body worked. Um, so, I knew that if I got up a few hours before I needed to be ready for school, um, I could do all my emails and get out all of my hard work at the start of the day um, and get that all done. During the day at school, I'd just be replying to emails here and there as I could. And then at night, it was all about finding what time my body worked best at different times of the night. So for me, I knew if I got home from school, um, I'd have a 20 minute nap because I knew 20 minutes was perfect for me. It was just enough to keep me rested um, but not too long that I woke up feeling groggy. Um, I woke up and I was ready to go. I was good until like midnight, one in the morning. Um, and then it was all about figuring out. So I knew between like six o'clock and nine o'clock, I'd just be doing a bit of creative stuff, like some stuff that didn't require too much brain power because I was pretty dead from school. My friends were all online. So I was jumping on social media and talking to them. Um, but then after nine o'clock between like nine and 12, that was when I could get my really hard work done because everyone was going to bed. Social media got quiet and I knew with like a little cup of tea next to me, I'd be good for hours. <laughs> um, and then that's really changed for me this year now that I'm running the business full time. Um, so for me, what my daily routine looks like at the moment is I'll be waking up around six o'clock in the morning, most mornings. Um, I will jump up, I'll get ready for work quickly um, and jump on the bus around seven in the morning, roughly. Um, after having like some breakfast and a shower and everything like that at home. Um, I'll do, it's like a 15 minute walk down to the bus just to like get the blood pumping, um, walking, I'm not a runner. <laughs> um, and I'll jump on the bus and just on the bus on the way into work, it's all about like prepping for work kind of. So I'm on like my business social media account. So I'm replying to comments that have come in overnight. I'm tweeting, I'm LinkedIning, Facebooking, Instagramming. Love my Insta stories so much. So chuck me a follow at Scott underscore Miller underscore. <laughs> Shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm always jumping on those business social medias. So seeing what news happened overnight um, and also to what's going to be coming up and what are people are going to be talking about that day. Um, and just making sure I'm really active on social media. So always sharing, I think for me, it's like always about sharing those updates. So other people, even if I don't see them face to face every day, they still know what I'm up to. Um, and they can keep, and I stay in the back of their mind. Um, then I get into work around 7.30 in the morning and 7.30 till nine o'clock is just about the things that absolutely have to get done that day. Like I will do them that morning. I'm um, just cause I know between 7.30 at nine, the office is pretty empty. Um, no one's online on their emails yet. So I can just like knuckle down, get some hard work done um, and get the stuff that I don't necessarily want to do, but I have to do done. Um, because I know from like nine o'clock till about five o'clock, it is just crazy. Like whatever I plan, it's gonna change. Um, it's very much like running to meetings, meeting cool people, coming up with new ideas and getting some work done in between. Um, and then I usually, so I get in the office at 7.30, I usually head home around 6.30 um, that night, so like 11 hours in the office roughly. Um, and then heading home, it's all about taking some time for me. So I jump on like my personal social media accounts, I'm on Snapchat, I'm on my own Instagram. Um, and I'm just like letting my brain die a little bit and just like scrolling, chatting to people, catching up on like my, what my friends have been up to that day um, and talking to them. And then when I get home, I like make some time for family. So I'll chat to my family. Um, I might go out for dinner with my friends, stuff like that. Um, and then generally around like nine o'clock at night, I'll do like things are quiet down a bit more. I'll do just like a little bit more work for a couple of hours. Um, just wrapping things up, getting a head start on the next day. And then usually in bed asleep by about uh, 11 o'clock at night. Cool. You yeah. seem like a really fit guy as well. Do you sort of get exercise in there? Oh, I need the... to get more exercise, actually. <laughs> um, I That's one of my New Year's resolutions for 2019 is get out to the gym more. Um, yep. Yeah, but I love exercising. Like, it's good. It's good. I need to do it more. Am I allowed to ask what the other New Year's resolutions are? Um, it's just really about growing the business more. Like, I think... I'm very, a very business orientated person. Like my business is my baby and my business is my life. Yeah. Um, so it's all about those business goals. I think like for us, we really want to be doing one international tour, one national tour and one Queensland um, tour every single month. Um, so it's going to be a lot of travel, which is going to be awesome, but it's all around, I think, staying healthy, staying fit and staying mentally sharp. Um, how, how do you do that when you're on the road all the time? Does it sort of mix up your daily routine when you're, when oh, you're always out? Totally. Like my, I just got back from about two weeks, like on the road, um, and in the air and my inbox is just like melting down at the moment. <laughs> to anyone listening, I'm really sorry. I'll get back to those emails soon. <laughs> um, but 
Yeah, I think it's just about really taking care of you and putting you first when you're on the road. Um, I've made the mistake... I think one thing that I've noticed is really different about school as opposed to now working full-time is in school I could pull an all-nighter and it'd be no worries because I know I could go to work... I could go to school the next day and just be brain dead. Like, I'd be sitting in class and I'd be physically there, but I'd just be, like, not there mentally. Um, And that was fine because I was just getting talked at. But one thing that I've noticed is when it comes to working full-time running your own business and especially too when I present so much I talk to people I meet people and I run workshops like I need to be on my a-game every single day like I can't afford to have an off day um so I've kind of learned that like hey staying up till four in the morning three in the morning is probably not the best idea Scott (laughs) um do you rely on coffee a lot or are you more of a tea guy or I'm 100% a tea guy I do love a good coffee though like I usually do one coffee a day and then tea for the rest of it um I found this awesome tea called yabba mate that it's a South American tea it's got more caffeine than coffee does but it's got a slower release so like it works you up to the high slower sustains the high for longer and then works you down slower so it's a lot smoother than coffee um tastes a bit funky but gets the job done for sure what was the tea how do you how do you uh, spell it yerba mate oh i could not remember off the top of my head it's a strange one put it um, in the show notes put it in the show yeah notes. put it in the show notes head to t2 they've got truckloads of it it's awesome it's unreal <laughs> yeah cool um but i think yeah when you're traveling just like a lot of it a lot of vitamins. Um, I love my vitamins. Like, just making sure you're eating relatively healthy as well. Um, taking time to... Even if it's not, like, hitting the gym. But for me, it's just, like, when I'm not hitting the gym, it's always just about, like, walking wherever I can. Like, when I've got time to walk, as opposed to, like, jumping on the bus or um, taking a car, I'll walk it um, just to, like, get that blood pumping again, to get out, get some fresh air, get some sun. Um, yeah, I have pretty unforgiving routines, though, when I travel. Like, I will pack my days just with, like, as much stuff as possible. Like, yeah. even over in China, some of my team were asking me, they're like, oh, are we going to get time to go, like, sightseeing? I'm like, nah, we've got meetings, like, all day, every day. Um, but just making the most of the time and, yeah, just, I always, I know, I kind of figured out with my body that I need about seven hours sleep every single night to be able to function, six to seven hours. Um and just making sure that I get that no matter what. Yeah, definitely. If you're underslept, I mean, everything suffers, right? Oh, yeah. Far, far worse than the productivity loss of just taking that extra hour. Totally, totally. Yeah. Cool. Um, I don't know if you've had any yet because you are still so young, but have you had any big failures in business, like any really big milestones that you've jumped over, hurdles, anything like that? Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> oh, so many. Where do I start? Um, I think for me, one of... Yeah, so I think one of my biggest setbacks in business um, over the past couple of years was going back to that story about buying the laser cutter. Um, So for me, when I was about 15 years old, um, we were, we'd originally started just making our key rings. Back when we were in the key ring days, um, we were just making them on our school's laser cutter. So after school, before school, I'd go in early or stay late just to cut these key rings. Um, And then I'd head back to the post office on my way home and ship them off um, all around the world. But then we started getting more and more orders and school eventually said, hey, Scott, like, we actually need this laser cutter for our students to do their assignments. Like, remember those things? Um, They exist. And so I said, all right, cool. Well, I'm going to go save up. I'm going to buy my own laser cutter because getting it done by someone else was just ridiculously expensive. Um, And that's what I did. So I saved up. It was about... Three and a half, four thousand dollars. Um, a lot of, uh, how old were you? 15? Fifteen. Yeah, yeah a lot of money. Lot. Like I remember, I sat down with dad and I did like all the planning for it because I'd been saving up for ages. And he said, "All right, Scott, are you sure you want to do this? Like most fifteen-year-olds, they're saving up for a car. You're saving up for a laser cutter." <laughs> um, and I remember I said to him, "I was like, look, dad, I can make money off a laser cutter. I can't make money off a car." Um, and I saved up. I spent the money. I got this laser cutter, and it arrived, and I was so excited. It came from China. I got it on eBay. Um, I talked to everyone, and they're like, "Yep, this is the laser cutter you want." I plugged it in. I set it up, and it just totally like fizzled and died no. um, on me. And I was just sitting there destroyed. I was like, "That's four thousand dollars just down the toilet." Um, Did you get your money back on it? Oh, I pushed them pretty hard and got about, like, a 50% refund, but just, like, they very much played on the fact that their English was not strong. Like, Oh, God. Yeah, they're like, oh, sorry, we can't understand it. And in the end, I was like, oh, stuff it. Um, so I kept the laser cutter, but I, again, just jumped on YouTube and I typed on, I typed in, like, how to build a laser cutter. Um, and 
using what I already had from this laser cutter, um, I pretty much ripped it all apart. Like I gutted it, bought new bits and pieces from here, there and everywhere and pieced it together to build this Frankenstein laser cutter. <laughs> um, Which would have been way better anyway than their laser cutter. Oh yeah, totally. Definitely. <laughs> no, I am not a hands-on person. So this was a experience to say the least. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, like I had to work hard. I don't think I've ever hurt more in my life than I have building that laser cutter. Um, just because it was mentally, physically, emotionally, like so draining to rip it apart and rebuild it. Um, and it was I was totally out of my depth. Like I was not a hands-on person. I wasn't techy. I wasn't ele- good with like electronics or engineering. So I was just kind this of. This isn't a light bulb went... either. This is a laser cutter. Like, yeah. It's... <laughs> so like there's like full electrics. It's like. 40,000, like 60,000 watts or something like that. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. Um, But I rebuilt this laser cutter. It took me about three months or so um, here and there, like whenever I could whilst also trying to do school. Um, But I finally fixed it and, yeah, it finally finished. Like it ended up working, which was like the best thing ever. I think I electrocuted myself like three times. Um, Better than five. Oh, exactly, yeah. Yeah. I was like, mum and dad are a little bit worried. I'm like, guys, it could have been so much worse. (laughs) I'm still here. I've only got like a little bit of a twitch. (laughs) He still does, by the way. We can see the (laughs) shit. Hair's still a bit fried. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it was just totally devastating. Like a massive failure on my part. Um, And yeah, draining. But yeah, just I think about for me, every time I have a failure, it's a learning experience. So I'm like, right, I might have stuffed this up, but I'm going to make sure that I learn from this and I'm going to be better for next time. So that's kind of like, I think there are two ways you can look at a failure or a setback where it's, there's one way which is, oh, everything sucks. Like, I'm just going to cry and lie in bed for the next couple of days, um, which is still part of the process for me. But um, <laughs> I think for all of us, to be fair. Yeah, just Netflix, ice cream, nothing else. Um, <laughs> Doesn't matter how successful you are, guys, Netflix and ice cream will always solve yeah. basically everything. Best emotional band-aid there is. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, yeah, always I always look at it like you can take that route or you can say, you know what, I'm going to learn from this and this is going to make me so much stronger. Um I kind of see, like, failures and setbacks as, like, emotionally and mentally, like, emotional and mental exercise. Um, Like, I can physically feel myself getting stronger, like, every time something happens. And, like, whilst it's devastating and it hurts so much, um, you learn so much of it going forward. Yeah. It's like a a mental entrepreneurial gym in a way. Totally. Every time you go, it, like, it breaks down more, but every time you get through, it gets stronger and stronger, right? Exactly, yeah. And now there's, like very like yeah now it's very hard to phase me <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i can see that just by looking at you you really chill and yeah, down yeah. To earth. it's awesome um so you definitely like to stay educated mm. um do you have any recommendations on maybe a favorite book a favorite source that you always get your learning from yeah just um for me favorite book i've just finished reading elon musk's biography which i thought was fascinating read like such an interesting guy um and whilst i don't totally agree with all of his management methods um <laughs> i think there was there's a lot to learn and he's very very switched on which is awesome would Definitely. recommend the read um also always love richard branson's biographies and stuff like that um i'm not a massive book reader unfortunately i wish i could be more um but i'm very much like a short sharp snippets um so it's always for me jumping on LinkedIn every morning whenever I can and just seeing, like, LinkedIn for me is the best source of news. Um, I don't have any publications that I frequent, um, but, yeah, just seeing what my friends and, like, what my connections are sharing on LinkedIn is really good because I know it's topical, it's relevant, and they're pretty much filtering the content for me, which is awesome. Yeah, I, I swear my LinkedIn's definitely lacking. Is there, is there people I should, anyone I should be following in particular, anything, oh. like, apart from yourself, obviously, <laughs> anyone else that I should follow in particular that gives great news and great updates? Yeah, I think if you're in the education space, Nick Burnett is a total rock star. Yeah. Um, as far as just, like, Brisbane stories, Lachlan Kirkwood is a really awesome up-and-coming storyteller. Um, and education as well, Sharon Singh is such a like awesome teacher um but i think it's just about seeing like who pops up on your feed like what are your connections liking what are they resharing everything like that and not being afraid to share i see some people that are like no linkedin's like my sacred garden i only let in people that i know and genuinely want to connect with and it's like no no like if you connect with a bunch of people you get a bunch of different news sources and a bunch of different opinions all coming together it's very true and thank you so much for connecting with me on linkedin as well Uh, guys just for connecting on linkedin make sure you tell them that you're not trying to sell them something in the first sentence because uh, i'm sure it's the same as yourself at this stage on linkedin every single person is trying to sell me digital marketing oh services oh, it, it does not stop yeah so uh, like what i loved about when Bryn reached out is he said hey scott and then like all in capitals in brackets i promise i'm not trying to sell you anything and i was like <laughs> i just because that was all i saw come through in the little notification i was like yeah. look i'm gonna check this out yeah. like, it's pretty decent 
<laughs> um, but I think, yeah, definitely with LinkedIn, don't try and sell stuff. Just be value add. Like exactly. your connections are on LinkedIn because they genuinely care about you and what the work you're doing. So post updates, share relevant content. Um, and yeah, just show all the awesome stuff you're up to. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. And I always leave the hardest question till last. So where will you be in 10 years? Oh God, I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where would you yeah. ideally be in 10 years? 10 years. I think for me, building my personal brand is something that I think is really important. It's a bit of a touchy subject in the startup space. There are some like diehard founders that are like, no, your personal brand gets in the way of like true innovation. Um, but for me, I really want to be building my personal brand and sharing stories. Like I think for me, first and foremost, I'm a storyteller. Um, Definitely can see that. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I would love to be traveling the world, just like sharing stories in whatever industry that I'm focused on at, them, and at that time. I think education is something that I'm going to be in for a little while. I think the education system has got a long way to go to catch up to the real world. Um, but also to looking at other industries, I love the work happening in ag tech. I think agriculture, again, is going to be something that needs some serious overhauling in the next couple of years just as our population continues to grow our weather becomes more unpredictable we need to be looking at other forms of agriculture and food um and ag tech is doing some really awesome stuff in that space and then as well like for me i'm just on a mission to empower people to be as awesome as they can be saying you don't have to take that traditional route you can do things a little bit different and also to just showing them i guess trying to show them the unknown so saying hey this is what it looks like when you defer university and run a business or like hey this is what it looks like when you work in a co-working space hey here's what it looks like when you get to travel all around the place um so for me it'll definitely be having a global presence um i love to travel so continue on looking at looking forward to continuing to do more of that in 10 years um and yeah just trying to inspire the next generation of digital creators so making sure that people are not just digitally literate which means they can like if you show them how to do something they can copy it digitally like coding or something like that making sure they're digitally confident so they have the confidence to be able to innovate experiment and try something different with the skills you teach them for sure that's awesome and where can everyone get a hold of you where can they follow you handles yeah. all that sort of stuff uh, so handles on pretty much everything is scott underscore miller underscore and that's miller with an ar um i love my grandma always used to say it's oh it's miller with an a darling <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah it's scott miller with an a um and also to head to either www.bopindustries.com or www.iamscottmiller.com awesome. um and yeah everything's there but jump on my insta jump on my LinkedIn um, always active on there they're my favourite awesome I've been calling you guys Bop Industry so it's B-O-P is no it's you... Bop it I just, Bop? Okay, I just spell God. it out because people don't know like <laughs> Bop no so it's Bop Industries awesome yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Scott. It's been an absolute pleasure, and hopefully people will reach out and continue to learn from you. Thanks for having me, and yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys get up to. Thank you so much for tuning into the show today. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed it, and uh, jump over to lessonsfromsuccess.com.au, and make sure you jump on that email list so I can notify you as soon as any more shows come out. I'm your host, Bryn Turner, and thank you so much for joining us.